Welcome to another episode of Fear the Old Lore, where we examine the English and Japanese of games for more insight into their lore. In this episode, we'll examine silver and gold as they pertain to the concepts of life and death in the lands between. Spoilers ahead. In one of my previous videos, I made an offhanded comment how the Elven Orcs were created by the Nox, but there isn't a ton in the base game to support that. The Elven Orc blood clot says, Elven Orcs are life forms made by human hands, but this doesn't necessarily mean the Nox created them. Instead, this information comes from some cut dialogue for Topes, in which he says, Oh, one more thing. Beware the Elven Orcs, accursed souls born of a forbidden right of the Eternal City. The curse withered the legs of the old and silenced the tongues of the frogs. His dialogue could have been cut for a reason, though, and we don't know for sure whether the Nox are meant to be the creators of the Elven Oryx in the retail version of the game. So in order to justify this claim, we kind of have to work backwards and rely on contextual clues to piece things together. Starting with a conclusion and trying to find supporting evidence for it isn't the best way to build an argument, but I think given what's in the final version of the game, we can still come to the same conclusion. One major bit of lore about the Elven Oryx that's a little lost in translation is that Elven Oryx can be understood as silver people since their name comes from Shirogane-jin in Japanese with Shirogane meaning silver and Jin meaning people. So how did they come to be called Elven Oryx? It's a little complicated. Basically, although Shirogane is written with hiragana and means silver, the Chinese characters for it could be broken down into shiro for white and kane for metal or gold. The translators may have taken this white gold and translated it into Latin with album being white and orum being gold to create albinoric. Generally speaking, I like albinoric as a localization since it fits the feel of the game rather well, but I do think it's unfortunate it loses connotations of being related to silver as a result. Perhaps Argyrian could have been a better choice to preserve some of that meaning, but that's going a bit beyond the scope of this video. Naturally, with George R. R. Martin's contribution to the writing of Elden Ring, it raises the question whether he created the term Elven Oryx. It's possible, but it seems more likely to me the term originates from Japanese due to the multiple ways Elven Oryx are meant to be related to silver, and how unlikely it would be to translate white gold as shirogane specifically but I don't want to get too bogged down by the details. So putting that aside, if we accept that the Elven Oryx are silver people, what impact would that have on the lore? While certain things are going to remain ambiguous, I think it helps recontextualize the Nox experiments with silver mimic tears, starlight shards, celestial dew, their night maiden's mist, and while the tennis quest involves delivering a birthing droplet to her albinoric sister in the apostate derelict. Let's start by examining Mimic Tears. According to their ashes, Mimic Tears are the result of an attempt by the Eternal City to forge a lord, and their mimicry does not extend to imitating the summoner's will. Silver Tear Husks elaborate, saying, The Silver Tear makes mockery of life, reborn again and again into imitation, Perhaps one day it will be reborn a lord. It's unclear how the Nox believed copying others would allow them to create a lord, but the inability of mimics to copy their host's will as well as the Nox experiments in creating puppets show they ran into issues copying their wills or that they weren't very concerned about bodily autonomy. Perhaps both. One idea I mentioned in my video about Estelle and the Primeval Current is that the Nox may have experimented with swapping bodies similar to the way Primeval Glintstone sorcerers can transfer their souls into new vessels. If Mimic Tears could copy the body of the original, it would save the hassle of finding another suitable vessel, and it's possible the Nox may have created the Elven Oryx either by swapping their souls into Mimic Tears or as an unintended byproduct in the creation of Silver Tears. But before going too far down that route, let's first focus on the Elven Oryx connections to Silver Tears. According to the blue silver chainmail armor set utilized by female Elven Oryx archers, it's born from the same metal as the archers themselves, meaning Elven Oryx come from a silvery kind of metal. 
Between the Albanoric Shield, Silver Mirror Shield, Ripple Blade, and Ripple Crescent Halberd, the Albanorics are also said to come from ripples and a drop of dew, implying the metal they come from is also liquid. This coincides with the way Nox flowing swords and hammers are forged from the liquid metals of Silver Tears, and leads me to believe that the Albanorics, or Silver People, are derived from Silver Tears, and is further reinforced in how the Albanorix Primordial Drop of Dew uses the same character as what's used for a Silver Tear in Japanese. If Albanorix come from Silver Tears, it would explain some of the similarities between them. While Mimic Tears can bleed red after they've transformed, they bleed silver just like Albanorix do well in droplet form. And just like how Albanorix harbor an innate arcane power they can use to channel sorceries, Silver Tear Masks provide the largest arcane stat bonus in the game at 8 points, and the Albanoric Mask increases it by 4. If Albanorics do come from Silver Tears, it might also help explain why their bodies are unstable and fade away starting with their legs. It is odd though, even though they lose the ability to speak, second generation Albanorics seem more stabilized with their ability to walk on their own feet or perform cartwheels. Take the following with a heavy grain of salt. Though second generation Albanorix look like frogs, part of me has wondered if they're regressing to a more primal form, one not related to frogs at all. Based on cut content for the Silver Tear Simi's questline, it might be possible that Albanorix and Silver Tears originally came from ants. If we zoom in on the icons for a Simi Silver Tear and its husk, its eyes still resemble those of the second generation Albanorix, and while it still has four limbs, the bottom portion of its body looks like an ant's abdomen. I've wondered if its arms and legs are meant to be modeled on a human, since it almost looks like it's wearing pants and boots, and if it's meant to show a Simi in a state of partial transformation, but this is fairly subjective. With the Noxine riding ants in Oxtella, it's surprisingly plausible that the origin of Silver Tears could be related to giant ants. Just like Silver Tears and Albanorix, the ants with giant abdomens explode in silver liquid, but to be fair, the ants themselves bleed red. But again, this relies on cut content, and if Silver Tears are meant to come from the ants, it's curious there aren't any Silver Tear husks in any of their burrows. This doesn't mean they can't come from them, only that if they do, the Nox probably have a role in their production. Albanorix blood clots say, Albanorix are life forms made by human hands. Thus, many believe them to live in pure lives untouched by the Erd Tree's grace. Because it's written as hearsay, it's unclear whether the Albanorix truly are untouched by the Erd Tree's grace, and there could be multiple reasons for this, ranging from being made of silver, potentially predating the Erd Tree, or evading the Erd Tree's cycle of life, death, burial, and rebirth via body swapping. Let's start by examining silver. Compared to the grace of gold, very little is said about silver, and most information about it comes from what's hidden between the lines of the game. Silver fireflies, for instance, are said to be found near bodies of cold water and touched by sunlight, which doesn't amount to much on its own. However, with the eternal cities hidden deep underground beneath a false night sky, it may be meant to imply that silver is a byproduct of the night, or that the night itself may have a cosmic effect on those exposed to it for extended periods of time. This is reinforced in items like Duke Hysterba, which gives off the faint glow of starlight, or the way melted mushrooms drip with a viscous oil which resembles the sheen of a silver tear. Both grow in the false night of the Eternal Cities, and according to Soap, filth covering the exterior eventually seeps inside, soiling one's very spirit. While Duke Hysterba and melted mushrooms aren't covered in filth per se, we're shown time and time again the core principle behind it can be applied a multitude of ways. Miranda sprouts, for example, adapt to their surroundings, and we can see glintstone variants in Lyurnia, scarlet rot ones in Kaelid, and even frenzied flame ones near the frenzied flame village. Even dragons follow this principle, with Smarag's body being corrupted through consuming glintstone sorcerers, Exyx breathing scarlet rot, Borealis being an ice dragon, and Fortisax being corrupted by the death bite within Godwin. Thus, the false night of the Eternal City seeped into the Duke Hysterba and melted mushrooms deep underground. But where did this false night come from? In my video on Estelle and the Primeval Current, I mentioned the Finger Reader Crone near the destroyed bridge in the northwest part of Limgrave says that Raya Lucaria's night sky is the product of its glintstone, 
but we can't see any underground near the Eternal Cities. Instead, we have the roots of the Erd Tree. Thus, it seems most likely to me that the False Knight Underground is either a product of Glintstone, the Erd Tree's roots, or the souls of the dead that couldn't be properly absorbed into the Erd Tree. From the Prince of Death's staff and the Makella Knight's sword, we can see that Amber is interchangeable with Glintstone to some degree, and from Selen's Primal Glintstone and the Primal Glintstone Blade, one power that Glintstone has is the ability to act as a vessel for souls. I don't necessarily want to make the claim that souls are what give Dukas to Urba or Melted Mushrooms their power, only that there's a relationship between Glintstone, life, the night, and the cosmos. Our art draws upon the powers embedded in Glintstone. But what is the nature of such power? Glintstone is the amber of the cosmos. Golden amber contains the remnants of ancient life and houses its vitality, while Glintstone contains residual life and thus the vitality of the stars. It should not be forgotten that Glintstone's sorcery is the study of the stars and the life therein, a fact lost on most sorcerers these days. Once upon a time, the stars of the night sky guided fate, and the fate once written in the night skies had been fettered by the Golden Order. The Nox who either existed alongside the ancient astrologers or were descended from them studied the night and used its powers in starlight shards to make intoxicating drafts to produce mindless puppets. For a while, I didn't think too much of the way Celestial Dew was said to come from the Eternal Cities, and I assumed it was the treasure of a bygone era. After looking into things more deeply, now I have doubts. One thing which stood out to me was that in the description for Celestial Dew, it's said to go by another name, a Night Tear. This doesn't mean a whole lot on its own in the English version of the game, but the Japanese name for Dukist Urba is Yotsuyo no Heruba, or Night Mist Urba. The reason it gets its name is from the way it's absorbed dew condensating on its leaves. With this, it's made me wonder whether celestial dew or night tears are collected either from these drops of arcane dew or some kind of synthesis using the plant as an ingredient. It wouldn't surprise me if the reason Albinorx cast sorceries using their inner arcaneness is because they're effectively crafted out of residual glintstone or something adjacent to it since Glintstone sorceries scale with intelligence and not arcane. However, there is another kind of sorcery related to dew, droplets, and the arcane. Oracle bubbles. Just like the astrologers searched for the fate written in the night skies, the claimant of the lost ancient dynasty saw oracles or divine messages within the bubbles they cast. At first, the two may seem completely unrelated, but if we take a closer look within their bubbles, we can see what appears to be a kind of cosmic mist filled with stars. While the kinds of stars within the Oracle's bubbles might not literally come from the night sky, I think it's possible that through darkness, one can come into contact with the primeval current and allow its powers to seep into the lands between. When Azura glimpsed into the primeval current, he saw darkness. He was left both bewitched and fearful of the abyss. The glimpse of the primeval current that the astrologer saw became real, and the star's amber rained down on this land. As I mentioned before in my video about Estelle and the Primeval Current, one aspect of the Primeval Current's translation that doesn't come as cross as well in English is that while Primeval Current is a great way to literally break down Genryu, another way to understand it is that it can be the ongoing source or origin of something. This can still be inferred from the English, but there's a stronger implication in Japanese that the Primeval Current could be a cosmic source of life for souls, especially with the way celestial bodies govern fate. The nature of fate in Elden Ring remains a mystery, but there's a decent chance it's meant to coincide with destined death since both come from Unmei in Japanese. The Black Moon of Naxtello was also said to be the guide of countless stars which govern fate, and I've since wondered if the moon that can eclipse the sun and keep destined death at bay is meant to coincide with the Black Moon of Naxtello since the moon appears black during an eclipse. The moon and the night in general may play a larger role in death than I would have initially expected. When the moon eclipses the sun, the sun becomes drained of color, becoming the protective star of soulless demigods, and keeps destined death at bay. Additionally, the corpses crucified throughout the lands between wake up and scream at night, 
So maybe the, the sun is supposed to tie into dust and death some way. There is the line in Warming Stones, which say the earth tree was once as warm as the gentle sun and would gradually heal all who bathed in its rays. It's possible this could be referring to the earth tree before the shattering, but since the Golden Order incantations don't restore HP, I think it's more likely this refers to the earth tree during the time of Godfrey, before Destined Death was sealed to create the Golden Order. Meaning, when Destined Death was part of the Elden Ring, the earth tree was like the sun. Sadly, there isn't much iconography for the sun and Elden Ring to flesh these ideas out completely, but what little there is is extremely impactful. In Castle Soul, the ghost before the Eclipse show tell prays for the frigid son of soul to be eclipsed so that life may be granted to the soulless bones. The general idea is still there, but the Japanese differs by saying grant rebirth to the soulless corpse or husk. Again, while these are extremely similar, there's enough ambiguity in the Japanese to suggest that the ghosts of Castle Soul could be referring to Godwin, or that soulless corpses can be used for rebirth. This might be meant to tie into how the corpses of soulless demigods can be used to duplicate remembrances, or the way Fia can lie with Godwin to birth a mending rune. I don't want to get too tinfoily, but it is awfully convenient that the mending rune of the Death Prince resembles the Eclipse, and that Rani, who represents the Dark Moon, is responsible for killing her brother Godwin the Golden, who is associated with the Sun in the Eclipse Hotel. I've mentioned before the mausoleums cradling the soulless demigods are of Nox design, and the Nox have an exceptionally complex relationship with death, so forgive me if I jump between topics a bit. Despite protecting the soulless demigods, mausoleum knights themselves are not soulless, and their armor says, The wing-shaped ornaments on its back evoke the Deathbird, a self-inflicted curse that ties the spirits of these loyal knights to the land, having willingly beheaded themselves so they may serve their masters in death. I think the reason these knights beheaded themselves is to symbolize that they've been drained of life in their blood, but I realize without context that's quite a leap. To make a long story short, in previous FromSoft games like Bloodborne and Dark Souls, being beheaded or cutting off one's own head allows their blood or life force to flow freely and be drained out of them. Thus, if the mausoleum knights drain themselves of their life, they might be protected from destined death, much in the same way the moon drains the sun of its color during an eclipse. It's unknown why the Nox would shelter soulless demigods, but if they have the potential to revive or harbor life, the Nox may have tried to avoid destined death by swapping bodies or potentially using their moon and night to block the sun. We don't have direct evidence of either claim, but there may be circumstantial evidence in the talisman of the moon of Noxtella. It's fairly small, the two jewel-encrusted cuckoo adorn the top of the talisman and hint at the guiding philosophy of the Raya Lucarian cuckoo knights predate them. To a glintstone sorcerer, the body is a transient thing. The cuckoo alone knows its insignificance, yet watches over it all the same. I don't necessarily think the Raya Lucarian cuckoos performed body swaps or anything like that, but with cuckoos in real life being known for laying their eggs in nests of other birds and killing their young, it's curious how far the symbolism is meant to extend to Elden Ring. One other aspect of the cuckoos which fascinates me is that they're typically shown in pairs and may suggest a connection to the twin bird who is depicted as the mother of deathbirds. Of course, this could just be a coincidence, but the main point is with Nox mausoleums blocking dust and death, the symbols of the cuckoo and their talisman, and the use of puppets that can act as vessels for souls, it seems likely the Nox tried various rebirthing rituals to circumvent death. If they truly did end up becoming Albinorix, perhaps there's hubris to their actions and being unable to reproduce naturally, or having bodies that break down and evolve in subsequent generations. The Nox practices may have even been carried over somewhat by the Karians as well. When we first meet Roger, he says the Academy of Rayo Lucario obeyed laws which contravened the Golden Order. Other than studying sorcery, we're not given much information about what those Ryo Lucarian practices were. Based on Selen's dialogue about the terrestrial taboos of studying the primeval current, and the way she switches bodies and is ultimately reborn into a seed of stars, I think Roger could be talking about rebirth. If you recall, I was exiled from the Academy of Rhea Lucaria. It was for attempting to restore the primeval current of Blinstone sorcery. 
The toothless pedantry peddled by the Carian royal family can rot for all I care. I want glinstone sorceries that open our minds, unbound by terrestrial taboos, no matter what we give in return. You wish to know more of Lady Renala? She is queen, head of the Carian royal family, and governor of the Academy of Rhea Lucaria, the great and beautiful Full Moon Witch. Sadly, her heart was broken when Lord Radigan left her. And then, when the Academy rebelled against the royals, she was locked away in the Grand Library. In the end, Lady Renala was left alone, cradling the amber egg Lord Radigan bequeathed her. Now she devotes herself to it through forbidden rite, the grim art of reincarnation. You would do well to remember, severing a vow, strongest of bonds, has consequences ever more dire. We are not told why reincarnation is forbidden, and there could be multiple reasons for it. One could be that reincarnation would allow one to avoid the cycle of Erdtree burial and rebirth, hence why Elben Orcs are considered untouched by the Erdtree's grace. Another reason could be that nothing good can come of it. In studying the primeval current, Selen becomes catatonic after she transforms into a seed of stars. Rykard's rebirth in the Great Serpent turns him into an inhuman monster, and when Bak is reborn, he also becomes catatonic and dies shortly after. Children born anew by Renala are all frail and short-lived, imperfect beings, each and all. Part of the reason I think Karian rebirthing rituals were inspired by the Nox comes from the way larval silver tears are consumed in the process and how Renala's juvenile scholars are unable to use their legs similar to Albanorix. Unlike her other children, the Tarnish is able to undergo a perfect rebirth, and I've wondered if it's due to the Rune of the Unborn. Yet if it were the Rune's power alone, then Renala's juvenile scholars should have been born perfect since she still had the Rune when they were born. Instead, I think the reason the Tarnish can still have a perfect rebirth is because they've been drained of gold and can be molded into any form, which can be paralleled to the way smithing stones work. Smithing stones 5 and 6 make it clear they're tinged with gold, and they can be used to upgrade normal weapons, yet somber smithing stones say, special armaments with unique characteristics cannot be strengthened with colored smithing stones. Unlike normal weapons, unique weapons can still be upgraded, but they're unable to change affinities in Ashes of War. Ashes of War are memories of the affinities and skills imbued in armaments wielded long ago. In other words, special weapons already have memories, making them gold in a way, and they can't hold any more memories from Ashes of War or have their unique characteristics overwritten by the gold in regular smithing stones. To be fair, not all somber smithing stone weapons have unique skills, and the Silver Mirror Shield doesn't have a skill at all. Instead, the weapons themselves have unique identities or can be crafted from memories in the form of remembrances. So why can somber smithing stones upgrade these special weapons whereas regular smithing stones can't? I think the answer comes from somber smithing stones being drained of gold. For quite a while, I thought somber smithing stones being drained of color meant they were colorless. I mean, it seems pretty obvious, right? However, in a conversation with Sinister Stromboli, he brought up something pretty interesting. Somber smithing stones 5 and 6 are gold smithing stones drained of color. So even though somber smithing stones have been drained of color, they're still gold. They're just not golden, if that makes sense. The way somber smithing stones are drained of color is reminiscent of the way the tarnished have been drained of grace, and tarnished golden sunflowers further support the idea by saying they retain their holy essence even though they're wilted and faded. If Golden Gold has unique characteristics or contains memories, then the reason unique weapons need somber smithing stones may be because they won't overwrite the memories of the weapon. This may also be why Sullivus's Amber Starlight Potion fails to captivate Rani, though there's also the chance she never drank it to begin with. Just like standard weapons, the Tarnished can be infused with gold, which is why runes can be used to imbue them with strength. I don't want to come across as saying that runes and gold are just memories, particularly since Melina asks us to share our thoughts, ambitions, and the principles we would follow when leveling up with her. Share them with me. 
your thoughts, your ambitions, the principles you would follow. However, it is worth mentioning that memories are interchangeable with runes to some degree, since remembrances can be used to grant runes in addition to creating powerful weapons and spells. Another way runes might hold the identities or memories of their owners might be found in Silver Tears. While not all Silver Tears transform, the ones who do unlock Stella carry Tier 7 Golden Runes only when they're not transformed. Part of the reason I think they assume the identities of the deceased is because rather than transforming into the player like a Mimic Tier, they transform into members of the Band of Fallen Hawks. After they change, they no longer drop Golden Runes, implying they've been consumed for their transformation. The Nox may have tried imbuing Silver Tears with a variety of materials in an attempt to either clone things or create the perfect being. One of the tears of Night Sacred Ground can turn into a troll, and the Nox may have even gone so far as to attempt to clone ancient dragons. The electrified Silver Tears in Noxella drop gravel stones, implying the Nox tried filling them with gold, and the reason they have lightning is because it comes from the gravel stones within them. These Silver Tears may not turn into dragons, but that doesn't mean the Nox didn't have some modicum of success. The Dragonkin soldiers have similar heads and limbs to the ancient dragons, and the Dragonkin soldier of Noxtella can even grow four wings like an ancient dragon and fly. There's a pretty big discrepancy in the Dragon Scale Blade and Dragon Halberd descriptions, and that one of their lines seems to have been omitted. The Japanese for it says something like, The Dragonkin soldiers were born as those who would be dragons, yet were unable to become them, so they were destroyed as ancient dragon imitations. It's possible to take this to mean that the Dragonkin soldiers were literally imitations of ancient dragons. In other words, Silver Tears. I'm not the biggest fan of this idea since we don't see the Dragonkin soldiers actually transform from Silver Tears, but like Albinorix, they can't seem to use their feet and can use ice magic similarly to how second generations use Frost Breath. Dragonkin soldiers also seem to have roots growing out of them and have exposed abdomens like trolls, so it might be possible the Nox had Silver Tears transform into trolls, who then transformed into Dragonkin soldiers, perhaps after partaking in Dragon Communion. However, even though we can see trolls like Theodorix who have transformed into magma worms, none of the drakes which drop dragon hearts look like ancient dragons either, so Dragonkin soldiers remain unique and distinct. What may interest me the most about them is their use of Ice Lightning. Frozen Lightning Spear says, The Dragonkin were born in the Eternal City where they knew no true sky nor true lightning. Instead, Ice Lightning was their weapon. The Dragon Scale Blade, on the other hand, says it was made out of a gravel stone scale that was polished into being unclouded, so it's questionable whether the power of Ice Lightning comes from the gold being drained from gravel stones or from another connection to the false night sky. It's also possible that like Ronnie's servants in the Dark Moon, the Dragonkin soldiers were granted the power of ice through the Black Moon of Noxtella, but I'm skeptical of this claim. Ice Lightning isn't the only lightning of a different color though. Compared to the Dragon Cultists of Langdell's Yellow Lightning, the Ancient Dragon's Lightning is Red Lightning. I believe the reason for this is that Red Lightning is infused more strongly with the power of life in a way that coincides with how gold during the time of the Crucible was tinged with red and was said to be closer in nature to life itself. Golden runes reinforce this, with tiers 3, 4, and 5 saying even now they're still imbued with the power of life, and as their power gets more and more concentrated, their colors deepen until red and orange suddenly appear in Newman and Heroes runes. There's a discrepancy in the Regalia of Eocade's description that might give more context as to how life is mixed into red tinted gold. The English version says the blade's copper coloration is not to be confused for rust, but is a conduit for its wielder to move it by their will alone. The issue here is that copper can be read multiple ways in Japanese, and in this particular instance, the characters Akakin for red and gold or metal were used. While it can be read as copper, this is a bit of an archaic term for it, and a different character, Do, is typically used instead. So while Akakin can be read as Akagane to mean copper, Akakin could just literally mean red gold. So to give a similar yet alternative translation, I have, It's the treasured sword of Eocade, a small ruined kingdom. Its red gold never degrades and moves freely within the wielder's key. 
Because gold can move through the user's key or will, it may be that gold acts as a conduit for the user's emotions, and the power of lightning can be channeled through one's desire to slay an enemy. This could be why ancient dragons can use lightning as a weapon or summon it through their roars alone, and why the Regalia of Yokade and Moray Executioner swords can dance through the air. In the past, I've wondered whether the dragon's red lightning and primordial gold should be thought of as an alloyed gold, and trying to comb through everything related to unalloyed gold has been a little vexing due to conflicting information. For instance, Loretta's War Sickle's Glenstone says it's supposed to have been replaced with unalloyed gold, and it looks like a red gemstone in game, yet the Halig Tree Helm, Millennia's Armor, Mikola's Lily, and the unalloyed gold needles don't look red at all. This might have been a mistake on the developer's part, since the gem or concept art falls in line with the other depictions of unalloyed gold, but I digress. The conclusion I came to in regard to whether primordial gold and the ancient dragon's red lightning come from unalloyed gold is that they're probably not the same. If we take Radigan's Rings of Light at face value that unalloyed gold began with Mikola, then the ancient dragon's gold shouldn't be considered unalloyed despite it being said their power is pure and overwhelming. Ironically, it may be that being infused with life is precisely why it's not unalloyed. Although Mikola's Lily is made of unalloyed gold, it being wilted and faded hints that gold may not sustain life quite the same way it's commonly portrayed. Heroes are in support this, saying, There were once heroes who walked the battlefields, abundantly blessed by the Erd Tree itself, who upon earning their honor simply died. Of course, we don't know the circumstances surrounding their deaths, but they still died despite being blessed by gold, meaning it shouldn't be intrinsically linked to life. So what is unalloyed gold, then? We're not given a direct answer, so treat the following with skepticism, but I think unalloyed gold comes from one's will or willpower, which is often associated with life or the will to live in FromSoft games. There are a few things relating to Fia, Roger, and Millicent that lead me to this conclusion. When we first meet Fia, she says that holding the Tarnished will allow them to share their lifely vigor and stout-heartedness with her and grant her the warmth of a champion. The Japanese used for stout-heartedness comes from Ishii, which means will or volition, and is the same term used in the Greater Will. By accepting our will, Fia is able to take our lifely vigor and transform it into a blessing, or even a mending rune at the end of her quest, so runes and willpower may be interchangeable to some degree. When Roger says those who live in death have committed no offense, they have every right to life, only they happen to touch upon a flaw in the order, Roger's Japanese dialogue differs by saying those who live in death are just eagerly trying to live, and that's why they've touched upon a flaw in the Golden Order. What this shows to me is that the will to live transcends death, and it's why those who live in death can sickeningly refuse the call to return to the Erd Tree. This ties back into how Fia says Roger possesses great mental fortitude that anchors his will and sustains him despite his grievous wounds. I don't want to get too off track, but I think it's possible the soul acts as the mind, and by lashing onto the will it can remain alive, even without a body in death. At first I thought those who live in death were soulless like Godwin, but since spirit ashes can summon those who live in death, I've had to rethink this position. My current thoughts are that although Godwin is soulless, the will to live lingers within his body and is spread throughout the lands between and death root. When the souls of the deceased come into contact with it, they become infected by Godwin's will and try desperately clinging to life like Roger says. Their unquenchable desire to live makes them effectively cursed to exist in a limbo between life and death. Millicent can befall a similar fate to those who live in death even though she's alive. After we give her the unalloyed gold needle that's been repaired by Gowrie with befouled blood, she regains the will to repel the meddling of the Outer God of Rot, and embarks upon a journey retracing the path Millennia took through the lands between. There is something I must return to Millennia. The will that was once her own. The dignity. The sense of self. That allowed her to resist the call of the Scarlet Rot. The pride she abandoned to meet Radan's measure. The language used is a little flowery, but the pride Millennia abandoned was the restraint she used to combat the Scarlet Rot. 
She knew she wouldn't be able to meet Radan, the strongest of all the demigods measure while holding back, so she abandoned her pride in humanity by snapping the unalloyed gold needle given to her by Mikola to fight Radan utilizing the Scarlet Flower of Aeonia. Like her great rune, Millennia's unalloyed gold needle was infused with her rebellious Ishir will, and by taking it in, Melissa inherited Millennia's will to repel the Scarlet Rot. For whatever reason, Millicent sought to return Millennia her will, but Gowry schemed to overwrite Millicent's will with her mother's by making her fall into despair. Oh, it's just... I realized that I'd soon be saying my goodbyes to Millicent, and my eyes began to well. She is to meet them very soon, her sisters, and when she does, she'll be defeated, surely, and begin to flower. Which is why, if you happen to be present for the girl's fight with her sisters, I ask that you side with the sisters and kill Millicent. It must be done by your hand, no other. Millicent trusts you, rather deeply, in fact. Sever that trust. Nurtured by betrayal, her bud will flower most vividly. When Melania ascends to godhood, Millicent too shall be reborn as a Scarlet Valkyrie. By betraying Millicent and killing her, she would fall into despair and lose the will to carry on, leaving only Millennia's will and the unalloyed gold needle to flower within her. If Millicent doesn't fall into despair, she'll still have the willpower to resist her transformation. Tell whoever put you up to this that if I am to flower into something other than myself, I would rather rot into nothingness as I am. Something similar happens when Dung Eater is given Celevis's potion. Oh, no. Oh, I am. The Dung Eater. Oh, yeah. <sighs> Though the English description of the Dung Eater puppet says, The Dung Eater despaired at how he met his end, and yet, its utter despair invites one to care for it. The Japanese version is worded a little more strongly and says something to the effect of, it's precisely because of its despair that it's worth loving. While Celibus's potion may not cause despair directly, despair seems to be a critical component in erasing one's consciousness or allowing external possession. Dung Eater fell into despair when he saw the order he envisioned being stripped away from him. Likewise, Nefeli Lu won't even drink Celibus's potion unless she feels hopeless after the massacre of the Albanorg village. When the nomadic merchants were imprisoned underneath Landell, they fell into despair and summoned the Flame of Frenzy, and Yura falls into despair and under the control of Shabriri once he realizes Eleonora won't be freed from her madness. Arena's Hayata seems to be the exception to the rule, but we'll leave that story for another time. Like with those who live in death, I originally thought puppets became puppets by having their souls stripped away from them, but Sullivan says the soul of every puppet has its own ambience, and we summon their spirits, not their bodies, when we call them. So, while puppets still have spirits or souls, they seem to lack a will of their own and move when someone else pulls their strings. Hence the reason they're called puppets. If Millicent rejects Gowry and removes the unalloyed gold needle, choosing instead to die as herself, instead of being held together by befouled blood, it'll be faintly moist with a spiritual kind of dew. It can then be returned to Millennia Scarlet Ionia, where it will transform into Mikola's Needle and become capable of averting the fate of the Lord of Frenzied Flame. Although it's unfinished and can only be used in the heart of the storm beyond time in Fair Missoula, I think the reason Mikola's Needle allows us to stave off the Frenzied Flame is because we inherit the will of Millennia and gain the power to resist the influence of the Outer Gods. It may not even be Millennia's will specifically, just a needle that's been infused with an incredible amount of willpower. Either way, 
If the unalloyed gold is supposed to be pure, would this mean that the truest essence of gold comes from the will? Maybe. There's probably something more to it we can't fully pin down, but it would be poetic if the truest essence of gold came from the will when the greater will is supposedly the arbiter of all things gold. With Mikola's needle being unfinished, it's also possible to conclude that gold merely has the power to contain the will, and that unalloyed gold isn't synonymous with willpower. As is tradition in a FromSoft game, everything comes down to individual interpretation, but I think it should also be noted that Mikola's unalloyed gold lilies can craft bewitching branches, which can be used to compel the wills of others, and the regalia of Eocade moves freely through the will of its user, so there is reason to believe in a connection between gold and the will beyond what we see with Millicent's needle. Because blood can be used to repair the unalloyed gold needle, it also suggests one's will or their gold can be contained within blood, which is partially confirmed in how beast blood and gold-tinged excrement are tinged with gold. This also goes a long way in explaining why bleed is such a debilitating status effect, or how blood can be used to beguile beasts and agitate the spirits of the dead with beast lure pots and cursed blood pots. Likewise, albinoric blood clots can be used in alluring pots to beguile humans and demi-humans, but what may be the most interesting aspect of these pots is that the two-finger sigil appears on them. While most of the two-fingers incantations deal with either healing or protecting players, there is a darker side to the two-fingers, and in addition to spells like Darkness and Assassin's Approach, the two-fingers are able to bestow Shadowhound Beasts onto Empyreans and use Pale Gold Shadows to beguile humans with Shadow Bait. I've mentioned before in my video about Estelle and the Primeval Current that I've wondered if the two fingers tried to take control over Ronnie like a literal puppet. As it turns out, in E.G.'s dialogue about Baleful Shadows, where he says if Ronnie resists being an instrument of the two fingers, life will go mad, his Japanese dialogue says Ronnie resists being a puppet of the two fingers. It's probably meant figuratively, but if there's even the slightest chance it's not, it does cast the two fingers in a much darker light. This is complete headcanon, so take it as you will, but one thing that stood out to me about Rani compared to a character like Zelen is that although both characters lose their original bodies and use puppets, instead of using someone else's body, Rani chooses to inhabit the body of a doll even if it has serious drawbacks. Could the reason for it be Rani refuses to take away the will of someone else like the Two Fingers would do to her? There's not much to support it, but I really like this idea because it would help characterize the way Sullivan says Ronnie's still a frail, gentle girl at heart. Going back to E.G.'s dialogue, instead of saying Blythe's thoughts hold no weight in the matter of his destiny, E.G.'s Japanese dialogue says Blythe's will holds no weight in the matter. If the two fingers are able to override Blythe's will to turn him into a baleful shadow, it would lend more weight to the idea that they may have also tried to control Ronnie. Another reason to believe the Two Fingers hold a special power to commandeer one's identity comes from how Aeneas says we can use the Two Fingers to steal the power of remembrances from the champions and demigods we face. If the Two Fingers can reshape memories as they please, it would be grotesque knowing you could be twisted into something you're not after you die, which may be why Aeneas comments on how the Tarnished recoils at her initial offer. The way the two fingers can control both gold and shadow suggests a dichotomy between the two, but it's a difficult subject to breach. For instance, runes can appear in skulls at night, yet at times darkness and the night sky are explicitly linked to silver. This is largely based on conjecture and might sound crazy at first, but I wouldn't be surprised if life and gold were originally tied to the day and night cycle of the Lands Between. Should you rise as the Lord of Chaos? I will kill you. As sure as night follows day, such is my duty, for allowing you the strength of runes. I wouldn't necessarily attribute it to there just being gold in the blood, but another thing which has stood out to me is the way Demi-Human's blood is said to boil when night falls, and the way their eyes turn red when it happens. It's the same as if they were under the effect of a cursed blood pot, which is probably a coincidence, but if demi-humans go mad due to the influence of darkness, it would lend credence to E.G. saying Blythe will transform into a curse as the Baleful Shadow. The Two Fingers' ability to manipulate shadows in darkness, and Beast's susceptibility to both, may be meant to work on multiple levels. 
The English description for the Cinque Dea says its design celebrates obese five fingers, symbolic of the intelligence once granted upon their kind. But the Japanese is a little more ambiguous and says it's modeled on five fingers, which symbolize the intelligence that was conferred to the beasts. It's possible the five fingers mentioned here are meant to be analogous to the two fingers, but there isn't quite enough there to make that claim for sure. Either way, both English and Japanese descriptions allude to intelligence not being native to beasts. If one attacks Blythe while Ronnie's two fingers are alive, he won't be distracted by beast lure pots, but once the two fingers are killed, Blythe's eyes turn red and he's vulnerable to their allure. Although he's still intelligent to some degree since he manages to talk before becoming frenzied, I have wondered whether the beast's intelligence comes from either the fingers, or light in general since demi-humans go mad at night. If light and darkness are linked to intelligence, it might also play into the way the sun is always shining on Fair Missoula, even at night. There's not much evidence to support it, but based on how the undead beastmen of Fair Missoula can be seen carrying Sunrealm shields, I think it's possible the seed of the sun was originally in Fair Missoula, though there are humanoid those who live in death that can be seen with Sunrealm shields throughout the lands between. What may be even stranger is during the fight with Blythe as the Baleful Shadow, his weapon is coated with the reddish-black flames of Destined Death. Because Blythe doesn't use Destined Death outside of this fight, and only uses ice after his two fingers have been killed, it would imply his vow to serve Ronnie was superseded by the two fingers, and that the two fingers have some power over Destined Death as well. Now it's time to put on a tinfoil hat and start tying everything together. When Aenea tells the player about the Rune of Death, she says it's the forbidden shadow that was plucked upon the creation of the Golden Order. I don't think Destined Death is meant to be a literal shadow since it's conjured from flames, but it is questionable how Malekith is able to keep it sealed. It could be because he's Merica's Shadowhound Beast and shares an affinity with Destined Death, but it could also be that he's able to keep it sealed because no harm can befall a shadow and he's unable to properly die. When Destined Death was sealed, the true power of Black Flame was lost, and compared to the flames used by Blythe, Malekith, and the Black Knife Assassins, Black Flame seems to have lost its reddish hue, similar to the way the Urchie lost the red tint from the Crucible, or the way modern dragons don't produce the same red lightning of the ancient dragons. However, there may be reason to believe that Black Flames, Destined Death, and Ghost Flame were all originally the same flame. When Rani used the stolen fragment of Destined Death to kill Godwin, the curse mark that should have been scarred into his flesh was split into two. If we compare the curse mark of Death to the sigil used for Ghost Flame, they're nearly identical, only the curse mark of Death is in a completely closed off circle. This is reason enough to assume there's an unspoken connection between Ghost Flame and Destined Death, but there's more. It's tough to see, especially while they're moving around, but there's a chance that Death Birds and Death Rite Birds were also imbued with Destined Death. Just like Black Knives and the Blasphemous Claw, there's a dark gash running down the Death Birds' skulls and bodies, and they're even able to inflict Death Blight with their shrieks. This gash is also in Malekith's Black Blade and the Rune of Death itself, though it's a little easier to make that out in their concept art rather than what we see in-game. Now, although Ghost Flame is black and white and the Rune of Death is red and black, Something that may be worth considering is that Ronnie only stole a portion of Destined Death, and the fragment of it we can see in the Black Knife print is blue. I know the Black Knives still produce red and black flames when they use the Blade of Death, but if the missing blue portion of Destined Death were returned to the rune, would it end up becoming purple or violet? I was originally going to make the point that grey violets are said to be the same hue as Ghost Flame, but it turns out this information differs slightly from what's in the Japanese, which just says that Grey Violets are the flower of Ghost Flame. This is a little disappointing, since we could have argued something must have happened to Ghost Flame to change its color. Even so, there is still some connection between Purple and Destined Death with the way the murky Violet Iris of the Beast Eye writhes when near Deathroot, and the way Tibia Mariners glow a spectral shade of purple and can reanimate those who live in death. For what it's worth, in the unpatched version of the game, some of Malekith's attacks that used Destined Death had purple flames, but they were the ones parable with the Blasphemous Claw, and most of his attacks still used red. Maybe it was more of an idea earlier in development that the true flames of Destined Death were meant to be purple, and it got walked back later on. 
The beastmen of Fair Missoula also used to have yellow lightning on their weapons back then, so they may have just not finalized a lot of visual effects until the very end of development. It's tough to say. Anyway, if the Rune of Death or Flames of Destined Death were originally violet, it would do quite a lot to explain the change in color of Melina's eye at the end of the game, as well as why the beast eye writhes near Deathroot. Setting aside the issue of color, there are still some other pretty big implications if Ghost Flame and Destined Death are related. For instance, if Deathbirds can dispense Ghost Flame and are imbued with Destined Death, it would call into question whether the Twin Bird is related to Destined Death as well. According to the Twin Bird Kite Shield, the Twin Bird is said to be the envoy of an outer god and mother of the Deathbirds. This could potentially explain why Melina has a wing-like scar covering her eye, depending on how much you want to believe she's related to Destined Death or the Glomide Queen. Mausoleum Knights also use imagery of Deathbirds, along with the Crest of the Eclipse to avoid Destined Death, which raises questions of how much the two are meant to be related. As I mentioned earlier, I think it's possible either the Black Moon of Naxtella or the Dark Moon could be depicted in the Eclipse, and even if they're only tangentially related, it would be fitting that if Godwin is represented by the Sun in the Eclipse Hotel, that he would be turned into an empty husk by Rani, who is represented by the Dark Moon. But then again, controlling Destined Death isn't native to Rani or the Moon, they just have the ability to circumvent it. It's often assumed that the reason Rani died in body and Godwin died in spirit is because the curse mark of death was split into two and Godwin was killed, but there may be more to the story. It's said the fate of the Karian royal family is governed by the stars, yet Radon arrested their cycles in a crushing victory, causing Selin and presumably Rani as well to become immortal. It may have been Rani's plan all along to slay her body to free herself from the Two Fingers' control, and Godwin could have merely been collateral damage. But that also doesn't align with how the Black Knife assassins are shown murdering him. But then again, we also don't see Rani amongst their number, and if Rani and Godwin perished at the same time, there are some major discrepancies about the sequence of events leading to their deaths. Of course, it's unknown whether Rani, Radon, and Rikard conspired together, or if Rani just took advantage of the situation. Rani giving the Blasphemous Claw to Rikard to defend against Malaketh would indicate the two had a close relationship, and Radon's portrait in Volcano Manor shows he was close to Rikard as well. It's possible to take this to mean the three may have worked together, but with Radon's adoration of Godfrey and Radigan, it's questionable how much he would have supported Rani's plan, leaving things up to individual interpretation. If the moon can be the guide of countless stars, and the stars guide fate, it would then follow that the moon would have some power over destined death as well, especially with its ability to turn the sun into the protective star of soulless demigods. My thoughts on the matter aren't final, but I've wondered if this should be taken to mean that destined death's power comes from the sun, or that life originates in the dark, but this view might be a bit shallow. It's easy to take the way life works in reality and unconsciously apply it to the game. However, we're shown that life is multifaceted in Elden Ring. First, there's the spirit or soul which seems to act like the mind of a being and can live without a body as a ghost. Next we have the body, which can live even without a spirit as in the case of Godwin. A third element which can be easily overlooked may be related to one's memories or emotions which can take on the form of curses after one dies. So if destined death has the power to end life, does that mean it ends bodily life, spiritual life, or both? The soulless demigods laid to rest in the wandering mausoleums would suggest destined death can end bodily life since they're guarded by mausoleum knights and their spirits are already gone, so maybe that would leave Ghost Flame to bring an end to one's spiritual life with the negative emotions they leave behind becoming the wraiths and curses and hexes like Rancor Call. If destined death and Ghost Flame are once one and the same, it would also mean that destined death is connected to health and steeple through ruinous Ghost Flame and Lampwoods by extension. I also don't think there's meant to be a difference between a candlewood and a lampwood, as the kinds of spirit trees that we can see guiding the dead match the Hofen tree's description and have a lit candle design. As a quick aside, because I thought this was pretty neat, Hofen comes from Helfen with an F in German, which means the helper be helpful, so they're literally helper trees that guide renowned spirits of the dead. I don't know if this means the Erd tree during the time of Godfrey was a Helfen tree, but it would fit in well with how the Hulfen's light is said to be similar to Grace in appearance, 
how Silurius spear and the crucible tree helm depict a many branched tree, and how candle trees represent a surreptitious prophecy of cardinal sin. Death birds are also said to predate the Erd tree, so it may be possible to argue the Helfen predated it too. However, one argument that can be used against it is there's a painting in Stormvale that shows the Limgrave Divine Tower without Stormvale Castle or the Erd tree in the background, and there isn't another tree in its place either. Then again, one argument against Godfrey's Erd tree being a candlewood is that it doesn't match the depictions of the Erd tree on the Icon Shield, Erd tree Great Shield, or the Erd tree Seal. So maybe it only existed for a very brief moment during the war against the giants before the giant's flame was sealed. Of course, it's still possible the Helfen tree could be completely unrelated to the Erd tree, or even a competitor to it. Nonetheless, with the rotten staff of the Avatar depicting the Halig tree as a kind of candle tree, and the way the prophets glimpse flame within the faith of the Erd tree, there's reason to believe the cycle of life and death within the Erd tree begins and ends with flame. O Erd Tree, you shall burn. Burn for the sake of the new Lord. Thank you for guiding me here. The one who walks alongside Flame shall one day meet the road of destined death. Goodbye. I hope you will become Lord. Lord of each and all. Before Destined Death was sealed with the rise of the Golden Order, fire may have been used to cleanse one's soul from the body, where it would then return to the cosmos or primeval current to potentially be reborn outside the lands between. I think this is why the Sword of Night and Flame is one of Karya's treasured possessions, and it would make sense that sorcerers would have studied fire sorcery before the advent of Glintstone. Traces of this past can be seen in the Glintstone Chris as well. While it features an Erd tree hilt, the way its blade undulates represents fire and is symbolic of an ancient ritual. The issue with this interpretation is that it's still contingent upon how order is currently structured in the lands between. As far as we know now, the soul is immutable, but this may not have always been the case. I'm really coming to grips with spirit tuning of late. I can see how and why immortal essence exists, a spirit under the golden order. I can understand their yearnings, what they become drawn to. As Roderica says, the spirit exists as a mortal essence under the golden order, which could imply that if we were to cease to exist, then spirits wouldn't be fundamentally immortal either. If this is the case, then before the Golden Order sealed Destined Death, Fire may have been able to destroy the soul. Another possibility I've considered is that Fire has the ability to burn gold or destroy the will, and without it, the spirit has nothing to latch onto to anchor it into the physical world, allowing it to pass on. Part of my rationale for this comes from how we use Fire to burn the Golden Tree, how Roderica says she's come to understand the spirit's yearnings, and how the Inquisitor's Girondol says, the smell of burnt blood induces despair in the victim. As I mentioned before, we know gold can exist in blood through beast blood, and if burning it can induce despair, it may be because it's burning the victim's will. This ties into Moog and the Omen as well. Because they have cursed, defiled blood, they're filled with the desire and rancor of excess spirits, which Moog can make use of by combusting them into blood flame. This is partially why perfumers like Trisha work to make sure Omen and Misbegotten died free of pain. Because the heart sings when one is close to death, and causes one to cling so tenaciously to life, their desire to live reaches a climax, and the anguish of those who die can become a curse that invites wrath to others, according to familiar rancor. Baldic and Blessings work by allowing those who are dying to forget their aches and pains, which is why tales of perfumers were akin to the origins of deathbed companions. In death, there is only peace, for in death there can be no sensation. In a roundabout way, this confirms that curses and wraiths are paradoxically alive since they have feelings of dark desires. This isn't to say all curses come from emotions. Although Merica cursed the fire giant to watch over the giant's flame, 
It doesn't seem to be related to the kinds of curses that afflict Omen, so there is a bit of inconsistency with how curses are handled throughout the text. Nonetheless, the Omen are born cursed, which is why the Omen bear an effigy begs not to be cursed or hated, and there's a strong possibility their curses are contained within their horns, since the amount of cursed attacks an Omen uses rises in proportion to the amount of horns they have. Dungator seems to have known this, and part of the way he defiles the dead comes from implanting an omen riddled pox upon their body, so their souls become trapped by the curse and become unable to return to the Erd Tree. It would have been extremely dangerous to deal with the omen due to their cursed blood, so much so that the omen killer Rallo imbibed a physic to rid himself of emotion, thus enabling him to enact his nightmarish labor hunting the omen. Perhaps he thought he wouldn't get cursed if he couldn't feel anything. What interests me in particular about the Accursed Blood is that despite its propensity to drive people mad, Fari was the exception. Compared to the other bloody fingers like Okina who are consumed with madness for bloodlust, Fari remains lucid. It isn't explained why, but one of the things Vari shares in common with Moog is that they're both able to feel love, whereas the other bloody fingers have lost their minds completely. They say mercy is a catalyst for bloodlust. And Vari's love for the Tarnished is what sets him against the two fingers who hold no love for their kind. Moog's love, on the other hand, is a little more complicated. It would be easy to point to Moog's problematic relationship with Mikola and call it a day, but Moog's role is a little more complicated than what's shown on the surface. In Bloodboon, it's said when Moog stood before the Mother of Truth deep underground, his accursed blood erupted with fire, and he was besotted with the defilement he was born into. His great rune elaborates, saying, His devout love for the wretched mire he was born into soaked the rune itself with blood. I don't have a good answer why love would allow Vare and Moog to tame the accursed blood, but in Dark Souls 2, love is described as a curse in the Bellkeeper's seal. Maybe the same is true in Elden Ring. If so, could the reason Vare and Moog tamed the accursed blood be because they were already cursed and couldn't be cursed any further? I'm a little doubtful, because Moog was born cursed as an omen, and his love came after he encountered Bloodflame, so the idea of love being a curse, and it being able to repel other curses, just doesn't feel as impactful to me as I think it should be. But to be fair, Morgoth seems to have recanted his cursed blood out of love for the Erd Tree, and laments it when his cursed blood is spilled upon its thrones. By my curse, such shame I cannot bear. Thy part in this shall not be forgiven. Another possible reading is that love is an overwhelmingly strong emotion that can allow one to endure and resist the kinds of negative emotions that spawn curses. In other words, love, like the unalloyed gold needle, might provide one with enough willpower to resist the meddling of outer gods. I'm curious as to what Vare loved, or if he was just moved out of compassion for the Tarnished, and I wonder if his decision to turn his back on the Two Fingers is anything like Bernal's, and has to do with the way Bloody Fingers are supposed to sacrifice their maidens, but I guess that's something we'll never know. A final possibility as to how Vare and Moog circumvent the jaw of the Accursed Blood is that when the Tarnished decides to become a vassal of Moog, Vare injects them with noble blood, presumably from the bloody finger itself, and from that blood the Tarnished feels agony or pain. In previous FromSoft games like Dark Souls 2, pain was used as a reminder of one's humanity against the Hallowing Curse, and the concept is carried over into Elden Ring through the Skeletal Mask, which says, This ritual implement relentlessly digs into the wearer's face, preserving one's human instincts while dressed in imitation of the Deathbirds. The pain or agony the Tarnished feels may be enough for them to remember their humanity, and Moog may be kept relatively sane through the curses coursing through his veins. I'm a little skeptical of this idea as well though, because if becoming a knight or vassal of Moog requires being injected with the blood of the Bloody Finger, it would seem out of character for Okina and the Nameless White Masks to have not received the blood or feel its pain. One aspect of the blood which fascinates me is that while it would be easy to attribute its existence to Moog, Moog didn't even feel its madness until Okina's blade touched his flesh. 
What this reveals is that the madness is something endemic within the blood. Those who continually shed and become soaked with it go mad, and the land of reeds with its plethora of weapons that inflict bleed succumb to the blood-soaked madness long before Moog metal Kina. If I were to hazard a guess, it would be that one's yearning or desire can be contained within the blood and the gold within it, and as such, it can have an alluring effect on those who come into contact with it. It's uncertain if all bloody fingers are followers of Moog since Eleonora and the Raven Mount Assassin don't use any blood-based incantations, and the cessblood might have already existed independently in the Land of Reeds. But it seems that if a weapon is soaked within blood, it can become sharper and even take on the properties of blood flame, as evidenced by Okina's Rivers of Blood and Eleonora's Pole Blade. This might tie back into the esoteric skills of Eocade, where Elmer of the Briar was able to furnish the Moray Executioner's Sword a blade that would have been soaked with the blood of countless victims with the skills of his homeland, allowing it to move freely through his will. To briefly go back to the idea of love, it's ironic that Yura warns the player to not let emotions stay their blade when it's exactly what he does in his fight with Eleonora. I am Yura, as you might recall. Hunter of bloody fingers, tarnished, held in thrall by cessblood. Zealots, who stalk their own. You stay the path. You're certain to face more of them. Just remember. No kinship with their elk remains. Their madness precludes it. Don't let your emotions stay your blade. He knows there can be no kinship with a bloody finger, it hopes that by cutting off her violet finger, Eleonora will return to her former self. However, she is either unable or unwilling to forgo its madness and cuts him down regardless. The man once known as Yura kept a woman in the deepest reaches of his heart, and despite performing the same actions as a bloody finger and relentlessly hunting down others, he doesn't go mad. At least, not until he gives up hope and becomes possessed by Shabriri, so maybe there is something more to Love's ability to withstand the corruption of the blood after all. The funny thing about Yura's love for Eleonora is that she wears the Drake Knight set, which says, From birth, Drake Knights speak not a word. They spend their lives pursuing the strength of dragons for its sublime beauty and inspiration of awe. So if Yura were trying to get Eleonora to return to her former self, she probably wouldn't say much in the way of a thank you. All joking aside, there's another line Yura has about Eleonora that's piqued my interest. Eleonora. It seems I am no match for you, but I've learned a thing or two myself. You see, I've sliced the finger off. Please. Please. Eleonora. Yield. The cessblood no longer do not stain the immaculacy of your sword, your flesh, your fire. His Japanese line differs by saying he doesn't want her dragon fire stained by blood. I don't know how literally his line should be taken, but one thing that seems to be shared in common between the followers of Moog and those who partake in Dragon Communion is that both become overcome by an insatiable yearning for blood and power. You must not forget though, those who partake in Dragon Communion will one day shed their humanity, their hunger for dragon, their yearning. Only worsens until the floodgates burst, unleashing eternal torment. The strength of a mighty dragon. Magnificent. But deadly. It's no surprise that dragon communion is ruinous. It's a little strange how Euro will condemn bloody fingers in one breath and suggest the tarnished partake in dragon communion the next, when both paths lead to shedding one's humanity. Perhaps the difference is compared to the dragons, which have a pure and overwhelming power, the blood of the tarnished is defiled and impure. In some ways, 
It would be convenient if following the path of blood would lead one down the path of the dragon, considering how Moog can grow wings in his fight and the way a dragon's heart continues to beat vivaciously, but the blessings of blood and dragon communion differ from one another. While those who take in the blood of the bloody finger have their eyes turn red, those who partake in dragon communion have their eyes turn a more brilliant shade of gold and gain the slitted eyes of a dragon. Despite their intense yearning and desire, neither path is strong enough to resist succumbing to the frenzied flame, so even though followers of dragon communion consume gold through blood and gravel stone, it doesn't seem to be on par with the level of Mikkel's needle. It's also unclear if those who partake in cess blood transform like those who take dragon communion. Sanguine nobles and red alban orcs would suggest so, but since Vare, Okina, and the nameless white masks don't transform, it might suggest there's a difference between a tarnished cess blood and the kind of cursed blood Moog has. One idea I've had for a while is that similar to the law of regression, or perhaps due to it, Gold yearns eternally to converge. Because gold and runes represent power, if it were to all become concentrated into a single being, it would essentially become the pinnacle of life in the current order. Thus, if something other than the apex being were to start gathering power, would it transform to become more similar to that apex being? I think this could potentially be what happens in Dragon Communion. By consuming dragon hearts and the gold held within, Men and trolls become more and more draconic until their bodies and minds can't take it anymore and they become deformed dragons. To put it another way, if we were to ask if Placidisax and the ancient dragons are the way they are because they're dragons, or if it's the gold that's made them so, I think the dragons represent the pinnacle of physical life and things naturally start becoming more draconic the stronger they become. This might be why those who are affected by the crucible started taking on more draconic traits or why rune bears have the slitted eyes of a dragon. One reason I'm inclined to think this is due to the way the Elden Beast and Ulcerated Tree Spirits faintly resemble dragons. If I were to answer why the Elden Beast differs so much from the ancient dragons if they both draw upon the power of gold, I think with the Urchi being offered the bodies of the dead, it originally absorbed their left behind wills. As such, my current view on the Elden Beast is that it's like the collective wills of all those who died and are absorbed by the Erd Tree, so it doesn't have a proper physical form, and it might not have any particular goals beyond a primal desire to stay alive, similar to the old one of Demon Souls, or the Moon Presence in Bloodborne. The reason the Elden Beast looks like a dragon is because dragons are efficient at staying alive. With this view in mind, I think it's possible to still see the Elden Beast as a vassal of the Greater Will, and it could also conform to an implication in the Japanese script that the Elden Beast is a descendant of it. If unalloyed gold is synonymous with willpower, and it comes from the Elden Ring which came from the Elden Beast, I think it would end up tying things together pretty nicely, but that's just my opinion. I realize I've covered quite a lot in this video, much more than I originally intended, so to give a quick recap, Elven Orcs come from silver, which I'm still not quite entirely sure what to make of yet, and gold either comes from or contains willpower. I think it's possible that life is a combination of spirit and will since spirits can live without bodies, and beings like crystallians are inorganic yet alive. Fire may have been used in ancient times to separate spirit from the will, and with the flame of ruin and destined death being sealed away, it's created a kind of stasis in the lands between where spirits that wish to stay alive can do so by virtue of their will alone. There is more I wish I could cover, and I don't expect anyone to agree with everything I've said, but I hope what I've shared for now is enjoyable and cohesive enough to help shape future discourse surrounding the game. I try to be very clear about what's fact versus what's opinion, so if you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like and subscribe. If you guys have any questions or comments, let me know down below, and if you want to discuss more lore, feel free to join the Discord server. The link is in the video description. I'd like to thank all my patrons, viewers, commenters, and channel members for your continued support. It makes working on these kinds of projects more enjoyable, and I look forward to producing more. Fear, the old lore.